Welcome to the overview of chapter 18 in the online textbook, chapter 17 in the hard copy. We're looking at international trade. So we have, we've looked at the principles of economics. We have looked at the idea of production possibilities, uh, comparative advantage, and now we get to the point where we're, um, and supply and demand, and now we're getting to the point where we're taking all those concepts and applying it to uh, the macroeconomic level. So think of before we were under a microscope, now we're going in a plane up to the 30,000 feet above, uh, above sea level, if you will. And we're looking out the plane at the broader view of the economy in terms of what's happening here. And one of those aspects we're going to start with in, in looking at is, is the idea of international trade. We talked about gains from trade before. We're going to address it here in this chapter. And thank you for joining me uh, for the overview. So what are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at this idea of gains from trade, the idea of, of comparative advantage because of of the uh, mutually beneficial trade that's going on. We'll look at some of the sources that come from that. We'll look at some of the things that countries do to try and encourage or discourage trade, including things like tariffs and quotas, um, and some of the uh, trade protections that are put in place that leads to a lot of trade agreements that we will see along the way. So all of this tying into what we're going to look at in this particular chapter on international trade. So let's start off by looking at this idea of comparative advantage. Now we have uh, talked up to this point about comparative advantage from microeconomic point of view, the idea of uh, the um, uh, the person with the lower opportunity cost has the comparative advantage. Uh, there are gains from trade in terms of what they can what they can produce and do it um, at a lower opportunity cost so they have the comparative advantage uh, and with trading with a partner there are gains from trade in that they can can consume beyond their production possibilities they can, can actually consume uh, beyond what they were able to produce if they just produced it themselves and this is the idea of international trade um, if you have a comparative advantage uh, and there are benefits and lower costs uh, for you to produce something, then uh, there is an advantage for you to trade with other countries and and to uh, benefit from that. And that's uh, this whole idea of using comparative advantage in terms of gaining from international trade in terms of what we see there. So uh, looking at this idea of production possibilities, um, uh, the idea of comparative advantage uh, when it comes to production possibilities is the idea of uh, we're producing uh, what we what we can uh, and we're producing at our production possibilities curve. We're pushing it out, creating that concave curve uh, because we're pushing out increasing opportunity costs to make Every, in terms of being efficient, to make people better off without making people worse off, to try and make as many people better off as we possibly can. Now, comparative advantage says we're also going to do that at the lowest opportunity cost uh, available between the two countries that are that are trading. And if we can do that at a lower opportunity cost, then that's a benefit for us to be able to trade with them for something that they may have a lower opportunity cost. Now, the question is uh, that I always get is, Mr. Robin, what if um, what if you know the country, your country has uh, a lower opportunity cost in producing both goods? Well, you can't. Uh, if there is a gain from trade, if there truly is a mutually beneficial relationship here in terms of gains from trade, um, one is going to have a lower opportunity cost in one aspect, and the other is going to have uh, or a more one item, uh, one good, uh, and the other uh, country is going to have the lower opportunity cost in the other good in terms of its production. So that's the whole idea of comparative advantage. There is a gain from trade to be made here. Now, uh, we, we look at this from the macroeconomic lens, and this comes from David Ricardo, an English economist who came up with the Ricardian model of international trade, essentially looking at that constant opportunity cost between two goods that are being produced. Um, I think that was key graph two in our in our graphing notebook, the idea of a straight line of production possibilities between the two countries. And uh, and this is also an idea of, or sorry, not between the two countries, but between the two goods that we're, that we're producing. Now, uh, the idea there was... Um, uh, it was um, it was producing uh, as much as we can, and there's an opportunity cost if we're producing more of good A, we're producing less of good B, and um, and that's kind of how uh, that breaks down. So uh, if you look at this uh, this idea of this curve, it is a straight line between two goods that the U.S. is producing. They're producing computers and they're producing roses. Now, um, if they're just producing among themselves, that idea of autarky, uh, which is I'm not trading with anyone, I'm just producing within my own country and I'm selling it within my 
own country, then um, we're looking at those goods in terms of if we're going to produce more computers, we're producing fewer roses and vice versa. And that's the idea of autarky here. Uh, you're a country that isn't trading with anybody else, and uh, you're just looking at what your production possibilities are. And that is a hypothetical in terms of if you're not producing more computers, you'd be producing more roses and vice versa. Now, in this case, we have Colombia and the U.S., in a hypothetical situation that are looking at what they should be producing. And in this case, what we see is um, that the, uh, the U.S. has a lower opportunity cost in terms of producing computers, where Colombia has a lower opportunity cost in producing roses. Uh, it is only going to cost, in terms of a box of roses, uh, it's only going to, uh, in terms of a computer, is only uh, 0.5 um, uh, computers that must be foregone for every box of roses versus the U.S. Um, in this case, two computers must be foregone for every additional box of roses that is produced. So Colombia has the comparative advantage in roses because it has the lower opportunity cost in roses. Uh, the U.S. has a comparative advantage in computers because it has a lower opportunity cost in computers. And a great way, by the way, uh, if you have the visual, a great way to double check your work here uh, when you're calculating comparative advantage is to look at the slope of the curve uh, because the slope in this case is is favoring um, uh, leaning towards computers for the U.S. and leaning towards roses for Colombia. And that tells us that they have the lower opportunity cost and thus the comparative advantage in those spaces. So that's what we see here in this particular model. Now, there are obviously gains from trade in terms of trading between these two countries. We definitely see this. And uh, the beauty of international trade and these gains from trade by looking at the lower opportunity cost is because they can now consume beyond their production possibilities. Now, notice what I said. They can't produce beyond production possibilities curve, uh, beyond that frontier, but they can consume beyond it. And what we see here at the uh, CUS and what we see at CCO uh, is essentially uh, them producing, or excuse me, consuming beyond uh, their production possibilities. They would only be able to con uh, consume uh, at, along the production possibilities if they were uh, only in autarky. Uh, but because they're not and there are gains from trade to be made by trading with Colombia, they're able to consume beyond their production possibilities curve. Colombia, same thing. Um, it would only be able to consume along the curve if it were in autarky. Uh, but because it is uh, finding gains from trade with other countries, uh, it is able to consume beyond its production possibilities curve as a result of what we see here. And that really is uh, the, the significance of international trade in a nutshell. Why do we see it today? Because of this, because of this idea of, of gaining from trade, there is a, a beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship of trade that's happening here. Now, uh, some sources of comparative advantage that lead to lower opportunity costs for some countries versus others. Um, the idea of climate is an important one. Uh, the Chilean grapes uh, that you see down there in the Andes Mountains, um, that's a good example of a difference in climate that is much more conducive to growing grapes than, say, you know, the uh, foothills of West Virginia. Uh, that uh, would, would not be as ideal a place as you see in Chile. So an international climate issue would be, would be uh, definitely significant there. Technology. Uh, some countries uh, have the, um, the uh, either the, they've invested in the educational aspects of really advancing their technological capabilities, uh, such as South Korea, really focused on education, really focused on uh, the human capital in terms of investing in those spaces, and it has paid off for them, uh, for a number of companies that we could list here, um, and, and in addressing their technological enhancements, that gives them the lower opportunity cost and thus the comparative advantage in those spaces. And then factor endowments. Uh, what we see here in terms of the, uh, uh, what we'll call, uh, we'll talk about in a second, the Heckscher Olin model, uh, but this is essentially capital intensive resources. Um, what it costs in capital uh, to pull oil out of the ground or to grow corn or to, um, uh, to, uh, to harvest other things uh, like. Um, natural uh, resources such as lumber and harvesting the lumber from forests and that kind of thing and growing uh, those. Uh, it's very capital intensive in terms of it requires a lot of capital requirements or capital resources uh, to to um, obtain those goods and to um, produce those goods and ultimately refine them in a way that can be sold. Uh, so that's significant there. Uh, but these are the sources of comparative advantage and some of them uh, obviously being very severe in terms of um, the differences that 
that others just can't compete against. Uh, you look at the factor endowments in terms of, yes, it is expensive for Saudi Arabia to pull oil out of the ground or the United Arab Emirates, uh, but it is also cost beneficial uh, for them to do that. Uh, they they are um, uh, significantly wealthy uh, and their economy has thrived as a result of that. So it definitely has helped them in terms of comparative advantage. Now, uh, just to uh, briefly talk about this, I I've never seen a question specifically about the Heckscher Olin model. So let's just put you at ease. But I have seen questions about factors of production uh, and, and the, the idea of factor intensity uh, could be one uh, that is addressed there. And again, that's the idea of how much capital resources does it take to pull that um, that product out of the ground. How many resources and how much money does it take to actually grow that, that forest and then cut down the trees and turn them into lumber? Um, those are capital intensive uh, resources or factor intensive resources. Uh, and it's gonna cost you more to do that. But we also know uh, with the uh, rising price of oil, um, maybe not so much uh, over the last year, uh, but, uh, but usually with the rising price of oil, uh, that tends to cover the capital intensive costs that we see here. So uh, there is, uh, a, again, a lower opportunity cost uh, for the countries that have also have set this up. They, they have these oil rigs and, and the capital resources available and ready uh, in order to be able to use them in order to pull oil out of the ground. They're not just moving those in on a daily basis. Uh, they're there for years, if not decades. Um, and so um, they've invested in that. And now the, the fruits and of their labor are really paying off because uh, they've invested in those, those factor intensive resources that we see there. Now, uh, it's important to note, um, looking back at the last chapter, we talked about Key Graph 5, the idea of, of perfect competition and the importance of that uh, perfectly competitive environment. Uh, we have an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve. Uh, the significance here is because of the fact um, uh, we've been talking mainly about domestic demand and supply. And now we're going to look at it uh, from, a, the, from the perspective of international demand and supply. So um, no differences in the curves, uh, just differences in terms of what we're talking about. Uh, but you can use the same model essentially for international trade with the upward sloping supply curve, downward sloping demand curve. Again, the law of demand and the law of supply uh, still applies here. Uh, the law of demand uh, is inversely relational to price. So as the price falls, the quantity demanded is going to increase. As the price rises, the quantity demanded is going to fall. They're inversely related. Supply, however, is directly related to price. Uh, so as the price rises, the quantity uh, supplied is going to increase because uh, of the profit motive, the idea of incentivizing suppliers to supply more as the prices rise. They're going to supply less. The quantity supplied will be less uh, when the price falls. Uh, and so the quantity supplied is, is less as the, the price is, is lower because of law of supply. Also saying when, when the price drops, less suppliers actually want to supply it at those prices. So what we see here is uh, the rules of demand and supply still apply uh, in this international trade setting uh, in terms of goods that are bought and sold. So no difference there in terms of what we're seeing. Uh, but imports are definitely going to have an impact here. They're going to uh, change what we what we had as a price at Autarky. Uh, and it could be different uh, than the world price, uh, what, what price the global market is setting. Uh, that can be advantageous. That can be disadvantaged uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the producer or the firm that is that is selling in the marketplace in the global marketplace in this case uh, so what we see here is uh, firms looking at comparative advantage we kind of already looked at this key graph in terms of what we're addressing here uh, but uh, the idea is uh, very similar to what we've talked about before the idea of comparative advantage um, country a has an, a lower opportunity cost in producing product one uh, the uh, country B has a lower opportunity cost in producing product two. And so uh, there are gains from trade for both of them to um, produce what item is their lower opportunity cost and to trade uh, in order to benefit from this. And they will be able to consume beyond their production possibilities because they are able uh, to produce at a lower opportunity cost for those items. Uh, so a great example of this uh, would be 
uh, the idea of financial services is something that we export. Uh, we export to other countries uh, and in places to places like China, uh, and we um, have a lot of financial services expertise and um, a lot of firms here in the United States uh, that even have offices over there uh, specializing in financial services and that sort of thing. And um, and then we will import a lot of goods that are made in China. Uh, so this is an example of the lower opportunity cost for us is in financial services, not in producing goods. Uh, and for China, it's in producing goods, not as much in producing financial services. And so um, there are gains from trade for both countries in this aspect, uh, both benefits benefit uh, from the lower opportunity cost of the item they're producing. And so it allows them to consume beyond uh, the PPF, beyond the frontier of what they are, um, what they are able to produce in Autarky. Um, and in this case, uh, we see that key graph five coming back again, uh, and anything above the price uh, and all the way to the demand curve would be our consumer surplus. Anything below this price point, and we see it right here, uh, this is our price, uh, that's set here. And anything above that up to the demand curve is going to be consumer surplus, a willingness for a consumer to pay. Um, they would pay, you know, $15, $20, uh, $5, all the way down to $2, which may be what the price is, who knows. And then the producer surplus is the willingness to sell by all different producers in the marketplace, all the way down to the supply curve. So they may be willing to sell at $2, but they may have been willing to sell at 50 cents or 25 cents or 10 cents. Um, and all of that becomes the producer surplus. Uh, now that changes, obviously, uh, if the price were to change, uh, that would affect consumer and producer surplus if it was higher or lower. Uh, but this is the basic model we're going to use in looking at international trade, this idea of key graph 15, the consumer and producer surplus uh, that we see in this particular model. So in autarky, uh, this is what we see. The price is at Autarky. Uh, no surprises here. Consumer surplus above the price, producer surplus below the price. And that essentially is in Autarky, meaning we're not trading with anybody else. Uh, this is just the price that we sell it in our country. Pretty straightforward. Uh, not a whole lot of uh, differences there. But um, as we know, with international trade, um, there are gains from trade. And so that doesn't mean that the price is always going to stay there. Sometimes the price is going to be more Sometimes the price is going to be less, uh, and that's going to influence governments to take action uh, through tariffs and quotas and other types of incentives or disincentives um, to take action in order to uh, help protect their, their cottage industries, the industries that are in their country, and trying to keep them from going out of business if, if the... Uh, the world market is has a price that's lower than what is being priced in their country in terms of being able to make it. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. So uh, let's look at this then. So the domestic market with imports, um, if we look at this, uh, notice uh, we're opening up to um, global trade. And uh, in this model, uh, we're looking at roses. Uh, and we know that we did not have an, a lower opportunity cost in roses. Colombia did, and so uh, that was not our uh, comparative advantage in, in producing roses. It was in producing computers. But notice, so we're opening our markets uh, to these Colombian roses, and the world price is actually much lower uh, than the price that we had for domestic producers of roses here in the U.S. Uh, so notice that the, the world price, uh, which is a showcase here at PW, is actually lower uh, than the autarky price, which means... Uh, that the consumers are going to benefit. Uh, consumers in our country are going to benefit from this because their consumer surplus is now all the way down to PW, all the way over here to this uh, domestic demand uh, point at, at uh, what CT uh, in terms of the, um, um, uh, the uh, quantity of roses, and then all the way up um, the demand curve. Uh, that's going to be a much larger consumer surplus. Uh, but the rose producers in this country are going to have a much smaller producer surplus. Notice how the, the triangle below the price is much, much smaller. Uh, many of them will probably go out of business. They'll definitely have to cut their costs or they're not going to sell any roses uh, because the roses coming in for Colombia are at a much lower price. So uh, they're either going to have to adapt and change or die, uh, essentially, uh, because the consumer surplus is much greater here uh, than what we see in uh, it, what we saw in Autarky in that model. 
and uh, and so the producers will have to change, or otherwise they're going to go out of business. Uh, and so what we see here is, as I said, uh, the um, the addition we had W as the consumer surplus before. Now it's W plus X plus Z. These two triangles over here in the uh, the light purple uh, are part of the consumer surplus now, uh, and so they are make up a much greater willingness uh, for consumers to buy things because of imports. Uh, and we've seen uh, when imports come in and we have lots of, of products on the market, many times they are cheaper uh, for us to be able to buy them. And uh, that is a benefit uh, to the gains from trade. It benefits consumers as well. But notice producers are struggling here. So uh, they did lose all of X uh, and they, they only have Y now in terms of the uh, uh, the producer surplus that is that is at work here. So Y is what's left. Um, meanwhile, uh, the consumer surplus has grown to W, X, and Z. So total surplus has increased. Uh, notice uh, what we had before was just within supply and demand curves uh, to the left of it. Uh, now we've added all of Z and that increases our total surplus and it increases our consumer surplus, uh, but it does decrease our producer surplus. But total surplus is still larger. So uh, if a question, and I've seen these, a uh, question is, you know, uh, what impact does this have on total surplus? Well, it increases total surplus because now the consumer willingness to pay, uh, the consumer surplus here is much greater uh, than it was in autarky. And that's what we see with this key graph, uh, exactly the same. Uh, the idea of a world price coming in is going to change that consumer surplus to include boxes uh, or, or shapes one, two, four, and five. Uh, and producer surplus is now at three. You're welcome to pause the video here in order to jot this down in your key graph notebook. I hope you will. Um, the idea here is uh, that the willingness to pay or the consumer surplus has expanded from one to one, two, four, and five. The producer surplus has has shrunk uh, from two and three to just three at this point. Um, and so uh, what that means is uh, many uh, rose businesses, rose producers and sellers uh, within the autarky country uh, are going to go out of business. Uh, they're going to appeal to the government for help. Maybe they'll get some help in the in terms of tax breaks or whatnot, uh, but they're still going to have to change their, their pricing model because if they don't lower their price, they're never going to sell any roses. Um, all the roses that will go first will be the ones at the world price. And so they're not going to be able to compete on that scale um, like the uh, world price producers are going to in this market. So it does have an impact. It definitely leads to uh, changes in exports and imports, uh, definite gains from trade. We're not going to trade with countries if there's no advantage for us to do so, okay? Um, and this is uh, and this is where we uh, we get into more of this in the last unit of macro uh, because uh, um, uh, President Trump talked a lot about the trade deficit uh, with countries uh, with China uh, and the trade deficit. But uh, you're only look at one, you're only looking at one component of that trade deficit uh, when you're looking at um, uh, the the products that are coming in. Uh, from other countries in terms of the money that's going out for them. What you don't see are a lot of the financial and capital accounts types of goods uh, that we're talking about here uh, that aren't always quantifiable uh, and, and certainly aren't as easily quantifiable uh, in some of these markets. And we'll look at some of these graphs, especially as we move forward and we head into Unit 5 and Unit 6, where we talk more about that in terms of um, balance of payments and and uh, foreign exchange and that sort of thing uh, in at the end of macro. Uh, but it's important to note that... Um, a lot of that um, kind of evens out in the in the end uh, in those terms. So what we see and what we hear talked about isn't always um, isn't always the same in terms of the overall accounts uh, that are taken into consideration when you're looking at the global economy and the U.S. economy in relationship to that. So uh, there's more to it than than just um, what what goods uh, what what types of uh, goods are we buying at Walmart uh, that's coming in from other nations. Uh, there's a lot more to it in the economy than that. But again, we'll get into more of that as we move forward. So uh, let's look at this idea then of exporting. Uh, if the world price is higher uh, than what we're selling in autarky, what we're selling in our, our domestic markets, uh, the world price is higher. Obviously, this is going to be a benefit to the country, uh, but uh, consumers aren't going to be thrilled because the price is going up. Uh, but also, we're not going to be selling as much to domestic consumers. We're going to be shipping it abroad. We're going to be exporting and sending this outside of the country because we can make more money that way. Um, by selling it at a higher price, we're going to benefit uh, the, the producer 
producers are going to benefit. And this is the computer model we talked about. Uh, so if, if the US has a lower opportunity cost and thus a comparative advantage in making computers, then we're going to make computers and we're going to sell them to other nations and we're going to have gains from trade and we're going to, um, we're going to export those. We're going to ship them to other countries uh, because we benefit uh, from those from that that trade that that, that production that's going on here. Now uh, the uh, the long and the short of it is uh, consumers in our country are going to see prices rise for computers uh, because why would we sell them why would we sell to them at an autarky price when we can sell to a global market at a higher price? So the price is going to go up. Um, and um, the do domestic demand is going to drop uh, in terms of quantity demanded uh, is going to fall. Notice it's going from point A down here to um, uh, to this point uh, on PW, uh, because at this this higher price, fewer consumers domestically will want it, but more consumers abroad are going to want it. And so the supply is going to be greater here, because again, the law of supply says the price is higher, supply is going to be greater uh, in terms of quantity supplied. And so from uh, between these two points, from the world price uh, that consumers are willing to pay domestically and what suppliers domestically are producing for the global trade, um, all of this, uh, the difference here, that surplus, if you will, what was our surplus before, um, is going to be exported. It's going to be sent abroad. It's going to be sold there. And the companies that are going to benefit are the ones that are producing them here in the United States and exporting them to other countries. And that's essentially what we see uh, in terms of the benefits of exports. Um, in terms of uh, you get you got to have mutually beneficial gains from trade, and you have to export in order to do that. And this is the model in terms of how that shake shakes out. Uh, so what we see here now is consumer surplus is shrinking. Uh, notice we went from W and X. Uh, everything above that price at Autarky, that was our consumer surplus before. Now it's just W. Uh, we, have, we, we have a much smaller consumer surplus because the price is higher. The willingness to pay is, is much smaller now because the price is much higher than it was before. Uh, but look at the global market, the producer surplus, everything below that world price all the way down to the supply curve. Now X, Z, and Y are all a part of the producer surplus. So you gained X, you gained Z, and total surplus increased uh, because the total surplus, the addition of consumer and producer surplus, added Z where it wasn't there before. So there are gains from trade. Uh, imports, exports, uh, lower opportunity cost in terms of the comparative advantage. There are gains from trade in these models, and we definitely see that uh, taking shape here in terms of uh, what's happening uh, with with the uh, the global trade and the imports and exports. So in this key graph, and again, you can pause it here if you need to jot it down in your graphing notebook. I encourage you to do that. Um, the idea here is the world price is rising uh, and, and it is higher than autarky price. Uh, this is leading us to a smaller consumer surplus that was part one and part two. Now it's just one, everything above the world price, uh, the much smaller triangle. And then the producer surplus goes from just uh, triangle three to parts three, two, four, and five. So two, three, four, and five now become a part of producer surplus. Everything uh, below the world price and uh, above the supply curve becomes that producer surplus that we see here. Now notice to total surplus, we've added four and five, uh, as I talked about in the last slide, and total surplus has increased even though consumer surplus is smaller. Um, producer surplus also increased because uh, of that total surplus is up, uh, but consumer surplus is smaller. But total surplus is definitely larger than what we saw before. All right, so let's take a uh, turn and talk about some of the trade protections that countries put in place in order to protect their cottage industries, or what we call the uh, uh, the the industries they're trying to protect uh, that that may be vulnerable to this space. Uh, there's a lot of talk about free trade. There are pros and cons to all of these types of things. It does impact an economy. Uh, we saw this with NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, when it was implemented in the 90s. Um, both parties pretty much on board at the time. Time, uh, with with doing this, a lot of horse trading going on in Congress to get it approved, uh, but ultimately was approved. And what we did see uh, was increased economic growth. Uh, we did see um, an improvement in the overall um, 
economy in terms of, of, of different types of jobs that were created. Now we had technology changes uh, and that would that led to advances in technology and and the tech boom ultimately um, uh, becoming a part of that. I think you know confluence of events there, not necessarily as a result of the trade agreement. Uh, but then you also had cons. You had a lot of manufacturing facilities closing and people who worked in uh, factories for for years and years losing their jobs, uh, losing their income, losing their um, their nest eggs uh, in terms of uh, thinking that I'm going to work for this company for you know 50 years and and then I'm going to retire and and uh, I'm going to go on my merry way and and those jobs uh, ceased to exist uh, they disappeared uh, working conditions changed uh, and and we see uh, that and we also saw. Um, a number of resources, not necessarily in this country, but in others um, that took shape and changed as a result of, of different types of trade. So um, it's not to say that there aren't pros and cons to this and governments and um, and societies have to look at this in terms of uh, what they're addressing, uh, in terms of uh, where do they play on this field and what is the cost? We talked about this in, in micro. Uh, what is the uh, negative externality uh, that is coming about as a result of this free trade? Is it a negative externality that outweighs the lower opportunity cost and the gain from trade in order to do this? And if so, um, if it is a, a greater, uh, if the negative externality is a greater cost, if the trade-off is a bad one, then maybe trade isn't so beneficial here. Uh, and countries have to make those decisions. Um, so uh, it is significant in terms of, uh, of what they're addressing. But uh, some things that they look at, and we're going to delve into a little more detail here on these, um, uh, they look at uh, using tariffs. Uh, President Trump did this, po uh, posting uh, tariffs on many goods coming in from China, uh, and um, and and posting those tariffs uh, that, uh, in a lot of cases, were just tacked on to prices that were given to consumers, and consumers ended up paying. Uh, so again, you know, who pays in the end? There's no free lunch. Uh, that. That is the negative effect of, a, of uh, uh, the impact on the consumer when there is a tariff. Uh, we also have quotas. Uh, you can only bring so much in. Once you reach a point, you're done. You can't bring in any more. Uh, that tends to drive up um, the, um, the domestic industries and, and helping them uh, to be able to compete in those spaces uh, in terms of leveling playing fields on the tariff front, but also on the quota front, and that so, only so many of them are coming in. And then we have subsidies. Uh, the idea of the government stepping in and giving um, uh, the, the uh, industries some type of subsidy. Uh, when China uh, w had the, uh, the tariffs imposed by President Trump, uh, what we saw were uh, these uh, tariffs were imposed, and as a result, uh, China um, canceled a lot of contracts with American farmers, uh, which left American farmers with products they couldn't sell. Uh, President Trump uh, had a plan as part of the uh, 2017 tax plan to subsidize a lot of that and paid subsidies to them. Many of them felt it, it wasn't a, a, a zero-sum gain, uh, but uh, the subsidy was trying to help uh, offset the blows of a tariff uh, in terms of the economic impact it was having on them. Uh, and and that, um, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent was, was kind of uh, what the government was trying to do to offset the, 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 the f American farmer in terms of uh, the uh, negative effects they were, they were having to endure as a result of the tariff. Uh, so let's talk about the tariff specifically for a second. This is essentially a tax, okay? It's no different. Uh, it's a tax on imports. Uh, you're taxing goods coming into the country. And in many cases, uh, the, the, the places that it's being shipped to, the products that are being sold, uh, they're just raising the prices. And so uh, consumers are going to pay more on those particular goods in terms of what they see there. Uh, and they're passing that along to the consumer, the consumer is going to pay more. Now we also know that when a tax is imposed, a, um, there is a, a, a deadweight loss created uh, because uh, you're not producing the same quantities anymore uh, because of the tariff that's being imposed. Uh, when the prices rise, we know the quantity demanded by consumers falls. Not demand, but quantity demanded falls. And so um, producers uh, then look at that and say, well, why am I producing as much? If a tariff is going to have an impact uh, on my product, I'm going to produce less of it. Uh, so what we see is a, a shrinking of the, the amount of tariffs, uh, or the, excuse me, the amount of product that is actually being imported into a country as a result of the tariff. And that is a designed, I mean, the purpose for it is to offset uh, the industries in the domestic country um, 
in the United States, for instance, so that uh, they can try and compete with the products that are coming in from other countries and other other businesses around the world. So notice here in the graph, um, the price, uh, the world price is is much lower than probably what it was at Autarky, which we saw at Equilibrium, right? Uh, but in this case, the the tariff is imposed, and this tariff is going to be higher than the world price, not quite meeting the Autarky price, which was at Equilibrium. So um, it is offset or trying to offset uh, the the pain of a lower world price but it doesn't always match up and I'm, I'm glad it doesn't in this case because it really does show you uh, just because you're, you're slapping a tariff on something doesn't mean that that the, um, the the domestic producer is going to continue business as usual it's still going to be a change they're still going to have to adapt change or die uh, because uh, they're they're going to have to start to compete with uh, the fact that producers are coming in from other countries with these products products and you're going to have to lower your prices. Uh, you're going to have to change uh, your way of doing business. You had autarky for so long and now you don't um, and that's going to have an impact. So notice uh, the supply at the world price uh, domestically is much smaller. The demand much greater as you can imagine. But with the price of this tariff being imposed, where does this price of the tariff intersect supply at a much greater uh, quantity, at a much greater quantity because the price is higher? Now, the, the quantity demanded is falling from what it was at the world price uh, domestically. Uh, so what this tells us is uh, that the difference here between what is supplied and what is demanded is essentially going to be the remaining import uh, that, that is coming in uh, because this is what um, domestically people will demand and supply. So um, everything else is, um, is essentially being cut off. Uh, you're, you're basically reducing uh, the product that's coming in um, before uh, the, 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 uh, tax was, tax, the tax or tariff was imposed uh, in this environment. So what we see here are two things. One, we see what the, uh, the imports were coming in at the world price, much greater from Q1 all the way to C1, was essentially the imports um, before the tariff. That was, that was this space you see here. Uh, but after the tariffs imposed, the imports are much smaller. And this is by design. They're doing this to shrink the quantity uh, so that domestic producers can actually compete. And so the effect here uh, that we see of this tariff is uh, total surplus is definitely falling. Uh, consumer surplus um, is, is um, you're going to look at this in terms of you're, you're losing what you had at the world price. Now at Autarky, if you compared it at Autarky, you'd say, well, they, they've gained because there is a little more consumer surplus here uh, from what it was at equilibrium down to the tariff. Uh, but usually we're looking at it uh, in comparison to the world price. And in this case, the world price was much lower, so consumers uh, are losing some of their surplus. Now producers domestically, depending on how this tariff is, is going to be imposed, producer surplus at this tariff price, they're gonna be able to charge at PT. Um, and so producers gain part A in addition to this little white triangle you see down here. That's going to be producer surplus. And then we're losing B, C, and D uh, to those open markets. Uh, B and D are deadweight losses. Uh, we're losing those all together. C is what's going to remain. That's the imports coming in uh, from other countries uh, in terms of the quota, uh, the, the, the product uh, based on the tariff that actually does make it in. Uh, and that leads us to this key graph, which again, you can pause the video here and then I'll talk about it. But the idea here is uh, with the effects on tariff uh, of the tariffs on this consumer and producer surplus, what we see is at autarky at equilibrium, uh, this this uh, consumer surplus is everything in the yellow. Uh, at the world price, it includes everything in the yellow as well as A, B, C, D, and E all the way down here uh, for consumer surplus. Producer surplus much smaller, this little purple circle or purple triangle you see down here. Um, but with the tariff being imposed, uh, producers gain part A uh, and um, consumers lose A, B, C, D, and E. Um, now, they will, they will, um, uh, the government will get uh, C and D in terms of the the tariff that's being imposed, uh, and they say, hey, we'll 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 uh, we'll kick that over to uh, producers, but it's never going to be the same. It's not going to be the same as if they were charging at Autarky, and that's the point that we're seeing here. So uh, total surplus is shrinking, uh, consumer surplus is shrinking, producer surplus going up a little, um, but we have a lot of the uh, the import market that is significantly hampered as a result of this tariff that's been imposed. 
Now let's talk about a quota because a, a quota here is essentially a legal quantity limitation on imports in terms of instead of uh, it, it's like a tax uh, because essentially a, a tariff is basically arbitrarily imposing a smaller quantity because they're they're raising the price right and we know price and quantity are intrinsically related well essentially instead of touching the price they're touching the quantity at this point uh, but it is still impacting uh, the the ultimately impacting the price uh, and that's what we see here so the quota or the quota rent as we talked about um, back in micro the quota rent essentially is that space uh, that is going to uh, be revenue that is going to go to the producer now in the case of a quota uh, they're importing products so it's the the the, um, the quota rent is going to go to the producer in the foreign country not to the government here locally so this is why a quota is not the best way to go uh, president trump imposed a tariff for that reason because at least he was getting money into the system he could then give to farmers and and redistribute to other um, industries that were hurting with a quota the money in the difference in the quota rent uh, in terms of the price is actually going to the foreign foreign um, business uh, that is uh, that is sending the product here so that's not benefiting the government or the industries that are local uh, that's benefiting um, the uh, the producer in another country so same type of model you see here in key graph 19 uh, consumer surplus still that yellow triangle um, at world price it would pick up a b c d and e again uh, but in this case um, you have a quota that's being imposed and that that quota essentially um, is a, is driving up the price uh, because uh, you're limiting just to c and d uh, the number of products that are coming in so between qa and qb essentially is the quota uh, that's that's being imposed how much product is coming in and that's leading to a higher price level now that benefits producers because then they domestically can charge more uh, it's not benefiting consumers because they're going to lose out on a b c d and e um, and it does shrink total surplus uh, because what you're seeing is uh, that b and e essentially are deadweight loss uh, and c and d is revenue that is going to go back to the uh, the producer in the foreign country not here to the united states so this is why quotas are kind of a, a dead end uh, and why um, many governments like to use tariffs more than quotas uh, because obviously the quota uh, doesn't give you any wiggle room in terms of using the tax revenue dollars to help local industries uh, you get none of that here uh, and that's where a tariff is more beneficial uh, it, it reduces the quantity uh, in terms of what uh, is coming in uh, but it takes the, the money from the difference in the tariff and the world price and gives it um, to the government which can then decide how it wants to redistribute so that's um, uh, the quota is not what we see as common as the, the tariff in today's day and age. But this leads to a lot of trade protections uh, in trying to, to protect industries that are probably dying uh, but are on the chopping block and as a result of world prices being lower uh, are really uh, going to uh, be negatively impacted that, like that. And they have to either figure out a way to change or they will eventually go out of business. The invisible hand uh, going to be driving them out of business. They will die. Uh, so a lot of trade protections and governments talk about this all the time in, in terms of trade protections put in place uh, to help struggling industries or industries that are just getting started, what we call infant industries um, in terms of just getting started. Uh, also to help those industries create jobs. Uh, sometimes it's industries to protect national security. Boeing, for instance, um, is never gonna go out of business why? Uh, because the government never wants Boeing to leave. They always want to have them as a backup in case they need them in times of war. Uh, they can make planes. That means they can make war planes. Uh, they can make other, other tools and equipment. Uh, they're, they're never going to go out of business uh, because they're at least going to have a product uh, that the government can, can uh, invoke the Defense Production Act and, and, and uh, transition to uh, wartime uh, activities for the benefit of the government. So again, that's another industry that's going to continue to be protected. Now it's protected more in terms of subsidies and contracts and that kind of thing that are awarded that way, uh, but uh, less so in the in the trade protections. Uh, but they have gone to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, uh, sometimes uh, when when Airbus uh, is not uh, working on a level playing field in terms of contracts being awarded and that sort of thing. So we do see some of that. Trade protections do create deadweight losses, okay? Um, and um, even though they do, um, the idea is countries aren't doing it to create deadweight loss or to hurt the consumers in their economy. They're doing it to protect consumers in terms 
of their jobs, uh, trying to protect them, uh, and um, as well as the industries in those spaces. Um, there are um, a lot of uh, trade agreements out there. Uh, we've seen one with the Asian nations that just took place without the United States uh, most recently. Uh, the uh, United States uh, backed out of uh, an agreement that was uh, going to be taking place um, uh, with the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the TPP. Um, and, um, and, and that's important. Uzmeca, another trade agreement uh, signed between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Um, there are lots of trade agreements that are out there, uh, and they are essentially treaties. Uh, their treaties that um, uh, find ways to uh, tear down the barriers of trade uh, of tariffs and quotas and try to open the uh, the playing field so that it is uh, easier for companies and consumers uh, to buy and sell goods uh, between nations with with less barriers in the way with less uh, tariffs with less quotas uh, with less trade protections in place and so we see a lot of nations uh, engaging in different types of agreements to address this I mean Ultimately, one of the biggest uh, that we have seen is the EU, the European Union, a trade agreement essentially uh, forming the European Union in terms of economic aspects and benefits uh, that they were trying to gain from that. So um, we definitely see this. And the World Trade Organization, um, not a whole lot of teeth there in terms of being able to do anything in terms of enforcement action, uh, but definitely has a role in terms of negotiating uh, and helping to negotiate or adjudicate trade agreements um, in order to keep the, leving, uh, the, 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 the playing field level in terms of um, what uh, countries uh, are competing with on a global scale and, uh, and trying to do that. And we can talk all day, and normally if we were in class we would, we'd be looking at uh, the idea of tariff rates. Now this has changed uh, up to uh, this, excuse me, had been on the decline for a number of years, uh, but what we saw here was um, with the uh, Trump administration, we saw tariffs being reimposed, uh, and that was kind of a game changer in terms of some of the, the tariffs that, that came out uh, during the Trump years, and um, to the tune of, of um, billions of dollars uh, that were being addressed. And then uh, China uh, in a uh, tit-for-tat situation, right, we talked about with uh, oligopoly, uh, in a tit-for-tat situation, you saw China uh, imposing tariffs on uh, things coming in, uh, imports coming in from the United States. Uh, so we see this kind of back and forth. Uh, who benefits? Well, ultimately, no one. Uh, and and the idea is trade agreements are, are where we, we have beneficial uh, agreements and mutually beneficial gains from trade, uh, which really does have an impact and really does uh, uh, tend to help economies and create jobs, uh, not putting up barriers in those terms. But again, uh, there are cases to be made for that. And normally if we were in class, uh, we would be addressing that in terms of this idea of fair trade or free trade, uh, vote with your feet in terms of, of what's happening here. And I wish we had more time to be able to do that, but we don't. Uh, but there's a lot of trade activity to take a look at here in terms of imports and exports and gains from trade uh, that can be done and uh, in terms of trying to address it. Um, the um, the important thing to note is uh, that there are mutually beneficial aspects of, of trading and uh, and the importance of, of getting into that is really the point of the chapter. Uh, why do countries trade with each other? Because there are gains from trade. There are mutually beneficial aspects uh, for both economies to be able to trade in that regard. And that really is the, uh, the underlying focus uh, of international trade in a macroeconomic environment for sure. Uh, I did include some explainers in these chapter notes that I think you'll find helpful. This one's on international trade. Uh, um, uh, looking at uh, what Khan Academy here, we have uh, Jason Welker, uh, we've got One Minute Economics and ACDC Econ. I've got another one here on comparative advantage in case you need uh, to brush up on comparative advantage um, that I think you'll find helpful. And then the last one on terms of trade, uh, the idea of kind of using the comparative advantage opportunity cost model and determining um, the um, uh, the ter in terms of trade, how much would they would they trade and, and in terms of it being a beneficial relationship. So I hope you find those helpful. I've also included the key terms at the end of the slides. Definitely check those out and uh, the answers to the take home quiz, which are also posted on my MCPS classroom under the modules for this chapter um, that you, I think you'll find helpful as well. All right, we will see you uh, again in the next chapter, but uh, we hope you found this helpful and definitely email me if you have questions. Have a great day.